speaker is uh, Mr. Stefan Patterson from St. Paul's School in London. Uh, he has recently returned from the uh, European Cancer Competition, uh, where his team came in third in the advanced cancer class. So, Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, the CANSAT competition is where I first met Eric. Um, we were competing teams. Well, that's one of the things I love about the uh, CANSAT program and ESA is, although there are different teams that compete for different contracts or different positions, there's a real sense of collaboration and helping each other and you get a sense that you're involved in some bigger picture. Um, so I'm going to give you um, an introduction to the CANSAT competition and an introduction to um, our team that went this year and our project. This is the, the team, uh, the four students that actually went um, to the Netherlands and launched the rocket. So uh, it's organised obviously by the European Space Agency, now in collaboration with a new company called T Minus. So the hardware has changed slightly from when we were first first in it in the competition. Um, and as many com competitions, you are launched to about um, a kilometre high, and the CANSATs are released and do experiments um, on the way down. Okay, this is the start of the journey for many teams when this arrives in the post or when the teacher collects this from the, the conference. Um, this is the box of goodies that you, you get um, with the T-minus board and various sensors. Okay, this is the new T-minus board that replaces the Arduino that we had before. Um, some more capability, it's still possibly in beta testing, I think some teams had some problems with integrating um, with, the, with the board. But you can program it with the Arduino and it's a bit more powerful than uh, previous chips. Um, for us, we ha added a few things but this, was, this is very good and this is very promising for the future. I think when this um, is through a few competitions it will be very, very high quality, um, it will enable very high quality experiments. <coughs> Obviously you need to transmit data, this is the new tran transmitter, um, I'll mention that, our, uh, that a bit later and how we used it. There is a primary mission for the, um, the CANSAT project that you have to complete. Uh, they send you uh, some sens sensors, you have to take telemetry data on the way down for temperature and pressure. Um, and then um, the secondary mission you come up with yourself. So uh, you have to present something that's original to get selected um, and, and then ob obviously in implement it. In the end we didn't use any of these sensors for the primary mission because for our secondary mission we had an altimeter which had a temperature sensor and a pressure sensor uh, which had much higher resolution than these, so we, we effectively decided to encompass the primary mission in the secondary mission, um, which actually was possibly not the best idea um, because we were so focused on the, the secondary mission. I'll, I'll mention that when I come on to some of the problems. Um, and now I introduce our secondary mission. We were called Team Vortex. This is the logo that the team designed. Um, and the idea was to have a quadrocopter, uh, four rotors in a can. Um, so the mission would be something like this. You would have the launch, CANSAT ejected at a kilometer. The rotors would deploy from the can, and then it would guide itself to a pre predefined uh, GPS position. So it was the goal was for it to be completely <coughs> autonomous, so it's an intelligent system. Um, so, in terms of originality, and we were fairly original, I think, in terms of technical um, goal, we were setting our sights high. Um, in terms of mission completeness, I'll mention that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So this is addition to the board. So we had a very small space to cram four motors in, uh, four rotors, all the electronics. This is our first design of staggering the motors so that they could actually fit inside the can. Um, there's the hinges on the lids that they would fold up into. Let's close up. So this is all 3D SolidWorks design. So this is our initial design of how the rotors would fit in the can and then pop out. Um, along with that design process, there's also the uh, designing the electronics hierarchy and um, along with the T-minus board, we had to add a few things in. So we had the T-minus control board, which is the, the heart. Um, then, as I mentioned before, we had an altimeter, which also had uh, pressure and um, temperature sensors. Initially, we included the thermistor circuit, which we left off because the altimeter duplicates that, and also the pressure sensor, so they, they were left off. Um, and then we added another um, microprocessor, the RGIMU, um, to control the um, quadrocopter, basically to um, run the algorithm that could control the motors and uh, sense its orientation and guide the, the quadrocopter. So it's connected to the GPS magnetometer and also the gyroscope and accelerometer um, and then also connected to the T-minus board we had the radio module, module power distribution board which powered everything um, and then the motor control through the T-minus board as well um, okay. Then, along with the design process, one of the requirements is that you um, have an outreach program. So, this is um, some of the boys presenting at a science conference that we had in our, our school. Uh, this is our second progress design document. I've actually got that one with us that um, you can leave through at the end if you want. Um, where you argue your case, you show how far you've got with your design process and then um, the experts at ESA feedback to you and uh, comment on your design and um, assess how you're meeting your, your goals. So um, in this competition there's now three reports before the launch and also one after. So double the amount of reports that we had to do for the first competition. Um, then we actually had to build it. This is um, Raphael, one of the team members working in, on the electronics. This is our main trolley of electronics. And this is the 3D printed um, prototype. Um, slight changes to the design that we first had. Um, and along with the hardware and the electronics, um, we also had to program the thing. This is a brief, uh, well, it's an overview of the programming structure. Um, I haven't a clue what goes on, on there. It, um, this time the program got so long that I didn't get into the detail of it. Um, but the, we used um, uh, algorithms, uh, PID algorithms, which um, are used to respond real time to um, to inputs and be able to output uh, a response. So uh, it, it's, you can have goal-seeking software, basically. Um, and this is the testing of that. Software. So in this test, there's four LEDs that um, take the places place of the the rotors, and as the board gets tipped, 
it senses its position and sends a signal to the rotors to, to change its orientation. See it being tipped, different lights come on and off. Actually, it's lost communication with the board. And it's restarted. And then one of the students also had the system um, implemented in a, a larger version of a quadricopter that we tested the code on. This is Dr. Tom Weller testing the, the large quadricopter. Um, it's slightly blurry. These are the, the rotors. And he's, he's not actually just um, <laughs> carrying it around the room, he's actually just holding it um, in his hands. If the video was slightly smoother, you'd be able to see it slightly better. Um, but that's at the point of it almost autonomously controlling it, it it's managed to get rid of any oscillations and it could hold itself level and um, so a few this is a few weeks before launch we were at this kind of stage and um, which um, oops, seems promising but when you realize how much we still got to do it was pretty daunting um, Then the, the goal was to actually start testing the project in the smaller version. And this is one of the first tests with the rotor deployment system. And so when the rotor switches on, the, the force from the rotor brings the booms up. But at this stage, we found that um, we didn't have enough thrust. It couldn't actually lift itself. The um, rotors that we got were <coughs> too small. And we actually had to um, order new rotors, which arrived the morning before we left for the competition. Um, so we were on the pla plane with a CAMSAT it wouldn't fly and was bigger bigger than the competition requirements. So there's bigger rotors and then we were straight into the presentation. This is actually the, the winning team giving their initial presentation and this is the, everyone watching it, watching. This is some of our team right up at the back looking at a CAMSAT that's half built. Um, so still to, to glue, glue on these new rotors. Um, they didn't quite fit on the shaft, so we were using hot glue. Um, the electronics didn't fit, so the rotors stuck out. Um, and so after our presentation, we were given a long list um, by the ESA judges of what we had to do to make it compliant. Um, basically, they weren't going to let it fly. They weren't going to let it fly if it stuck out. It wouldn't fit in the rocket. Um, if the rotors deployed, they could um, bring the rocket down or um, disrupt the flight for, for other CANSATs. So that we had to have a, a safety switch that meant that it only deployed when it left the CAM. They suggested a, a, a start switch that was pulled by a parachute. So we had to add a parachute a start switch on the top. We had to reposition all the electronics. Um, we had to glue on the rotors. Um, and then after doing all that, we tested it at full power and the hot glue wasn't strong enough. <laughs> and this is at, uh, I guess, four o'clock, the day before the launch. We all seemed to be working. We tested it and the hot glue breaks and the rotors fly across the room. So we arrive um, 
Oh, and, and there was another requirement that um, because we were in a military base um, and our CANSAT could have taken a long time to descend, it might have gone over the boundary. So we had to program in um, a, a kill code. So the GPS had to, if it lost contact with the GPS for a certain amount of time or it went over a boundary, um, then it had to kill the can and crash it into the ground, basically. So this is where we were based. This is the launch site. We were given this as our um, goal to get to. The prevailing wind is that way. We've got a parachute on and the kill zone is a line up that way, a line that way, and um, a, I think it was about a kilometre or so that way. And, and, and so we had to, that launch path. So we were actually quite glad we had the parachute um, as well at that point because um, if you had gone over the edge with a kill switch and had to just drop your can into the ground, it wouldn't have really come back that intact. And um, so this is after we'd re repositioned all the electronics and hot glued our rotors on. Eventually, we, the rotors came off again just before launch. We were on the third rocket and we borrowed some super glue and put them on and managed to just get everything in so that um, it was slightly pushing out of the rocket and he pushed it down and got it, got it stuffed in. Um, and we, we got, got to launch. Um, and we were on the third launch, and I have to say that the first two rockets didn't release their cams. So, so it didn't look like we were going to get much out of this. But um, actually, that's um, the morning of the launch. That's before we got to launch. Um, waiting for the bus, everyone was so tired, we just fell asleep. Um, and this is the, the launch. The third rocket. Straight up into the clouds. So very quickly we lost visual contact. Um, and at that point we lost radio contact as well. <laughs> um, and because we've been focusing so much on our secondary mission, and the primary mission was just um, uh, tagged on, if you like. Um, we didn't actually think to have a, a backup system for the primary mission, so there was no onboard memory, there weren't recording data, and when we lost radio contact, we effectively completely lost our primary mission. Um, and um, we were unsure if we, we would get it recovered, so the, the rockets were recovered first, and then we were overjoyed when we actually got our can set back with very little damage actually. Um, the only mishap that seemed to have happened was that our parachute had got tangled up with another team's and wrapped around. We think what happened is that shortly after launch the, the parachute's entangled and our quadricopter just basically spun, wound itself around the other can. Um, uh, but when it landed there was minimal damage. Um, but, like I said, no primary mission data, um, uh, and then we had to present our results. These are the awards. Um, and basically, with the mission completeness, um, I think we, were, we did very well to, to get the, the bronze in the advanced category. So, in those first two, in terms of originality, in terms of technical um, goals, I'm sure we scored very high. In terms of mission completeness, we had no primary data. Um, we didn't comply with the rules because of the bigger rotors and it didn't quite fit. Um, we had to be longer than the rules required. We had to fudge it because we had a very small parachute and the rotors were part of our descent system. Um, but we got it back intact, we, and hopefully um, the Phoenix will fly again. <coughs>
and, and this is um, all the teams together. The, after the, the prize presentation, there was, um, it was time to go around the ESA's center in uh, Nordvik, um, and then a slap-up meal and bowling afterwards. It was all very good fun. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>